seated. Thank you, Norma and Dustin. Norma Swigert has given music lessons to many students over the years, and one of her students has been Dustin. 
And now Dustin and Norma play together after all these years. So thank you so much to both of you for this good music. Next Sunday, as you know, is Christmas Day, the 25th of December. And it'll be a special time in our service. We're going to have the blessing of having our Vietnamese church, which normally meets on Sunday afternoons, meeting with us next Sunday morning. So we're looking forward to that. And one of the reasons for that is because on Sunday afternoon, beginning about 1 o'clock, the TCFMN, that's the Telugu Christian Fellowship of Minnesota, made up of many families from India, will be having a special Christmas event. Every year they have a Christmas event in our church, and it needs to be on Christmas Day, because that's the day that means so much to the people who uh, are in India. And this is an outreach ministry, as so many people come from non-Christian homes who are friends of families from India, they come to hear the gospel. So if you'll be in prayer for that, it's a full day, and they, have, uh, they, they pack our church with people and with food and all kinds of wonderful events. So if you'd be in prayer for that for next Sunday, it would be great. Another thing that is done a lot by the India people is caroling. It's kind of a tradition that some of us have lost over the years, but they do a lot of caroling. And from what I understand, they carol late into the evening. By late, I mean like one in the morning, <laughs> they're still caroling. So they've done a lot of that over the last couple of weeks, and we thank the Lord for that. Thank you to all of you who participate in that. These next moments are time for prayer. We were scheduled to have a parent-child dedication service this morning, but the children who were going to be involved became sick during the week, and so we're going to have to reschedule that. So if you pray for the families of the children who were scheduled to, to be involved this morning, it would be great. And we want to honor those who have birthdays. We have Joe Bunn, and anniversary for Teja Navia Pendurthy. Congratulations to you on your anniversary coming this week. So there may be someone that you know of who you would like to pray for. If you would do that in your hearts as we pray, let us look to the Lord at this time. Our Heavenly Father, in these precious moments, we ask your forgiveness for our sins. We thank you for the grace of Jesus, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who cover our sins by the blood of Christ. We pray today that you will touch the lives of those who need your strength. We pray for Dan Downey, who is recovering from a heart bypass surgery, also is scheduled for further surgeries. We pray for the Bluell family, for Marilyn, who has been sick. We also pray for Brenda Sabastina's niece's husband, Aaron, for his lymphoma. We pray for Sheila Massey, who is recovering from a stroke and is now home. We thank you for that, but we still need much rest and therapy. Hopefully she'll be back with us soon. We also pray for Claudette Surgeon's friend, Allison Brigadier. We pray for Claudette herself, that she will recover completely from her bronchitis. We pray for Janine Olson's daughter-in-law, Anne, that you will be with her as she is in need of strength for the pain she has with her jawbone problem. We pray for Mike Kramlinger for his health. We pray for Teja and Navia, for their family members, so many of them that are, they are praying for, and we thank you for that, and we ask that you will touch the lives of each one of them. We would also pray today for Lisa Kennedy's brother, Bob, as she is praying for his salvation. We pray for Lois Larson, as she is in her room at the Shalom House, but is, has a good attitude and is celebrating Christmas by viewing our services and other services throughout the week. We would also pray for Sunil and Shiny, Shauna Grace, for health and strength. We pray for Bob and Judy Iverson, that you will be with them in their time of health needs as well. We pray for each of our missionaries, for the Gospel Association of India and Yesu Bandela, 
for Danny Milabathula, who was with us last Sunday, how blessed we were for that. We pray for Sonny Milabathula. We also pray for Paul and Jeannie Johnson. We pray for Jacob and Elizabeth Delich, for Barbara Wright, for Jeff and Margie Pearson, for Chaplain Millett, and for Napoleon and Dora Maynard, and other missionaries who are not part of our support ministry, but missionaries that our people know and love. We'd also pray for our Vietnamese church, that you will bless them. We pray for the Telugu Christian Fellowship of Minnesota, especially as they have their Christmas event next Sunday. And we pray, Lord, that at this time of the year as we celebrate Christmas, we know that there is so much depth in the Christmas message. And we pray that it might be come clear to those who are wondering and curious about what does Christmas really mean. Guide us now as we study your word today. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I would invite you to turn your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We will read this morning from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 21. In honor to the word of God, will you please stand as we read. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this passage of scripture and we pray that you will guide our thoughts as we consider some of the words in these verses as well as other verses throughout the Bible. We ask, Lord, for the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, to minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. In our Christmas messages, we're talking today about peace with God, the wonderful prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, and this prophecy was made about 700 years before Christ was born. For unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Consular the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David to order and to establish it from this time and henceforth forevermore. Those are great words, great verses. And to think of the description of Jesus given so graphically 700 years before he came, the Holy Spirit revealed to Isaiah the nature of Christ, Today we're talking about the Prince of Peace. Joseph's and Mary's trip to Bethlehem from Nazareth was necessary because there had been a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed and they had to go to their hometown, which was Bethlehem. And as they made their way to Bethlehem, Mary was expecting a child. We know so well the story of how that child was conceived in her by the Holy Spirit. Again, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the prophet says, A virgin will conceive and be with child, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. And as they made their way to Bethlehem, they arrived, and there was no room for them to stay anywhere. So they ended up in a stable. And there the baby was born, the Son of God, God himself, in that little manger, and there was the birthplace of Jesus, our Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. 
He came in humility, but he came as one who was going to give his life for us. As the shepherds were in the fields, it says that an angel appeared to them. And the angel said, behold, the angel gave the message that the Christ was born. There is born to you in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. We think of those words, peace, goodwill toward men. This is one of the many wonderful blessings of the birth of Christ. Many times people focus on the manger and the baby, but there's so much more than that. Because far beyond the birth of Christ is the ministry of Christ, the reason why he came. He came as the mighty God, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, the incarnation, God became a man. And today we think about the fact that he came as the minister of reconciliation, as we have read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Reconciliation, that was the main purpose of Christ's coming. Reconciliation means to redeem. It means to bring into harmony someone who is out of harmony. It means to bring into union someone who needs to be united. And it's a spiritual, wonderful promise that God gave us. The Prince of Peace would bring reconciliation to a lost world. As we look at these verses today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there are seven words that I'd like to have us think about that kind of give us the context of the peace that the Lord is going to give us. And it all centers in the one concept of reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean? It means to make right with God. It means there would be no more conflict. There would be an era of calmness, contentment in our hearts. There's no more quarreling, no more arguing, no more fighting. The world isn't like that today, is there? The Prince of Peace has come, but the peace has eluded most of the world. But we who believe in Jesus understand what that peace is and how deep it is and how powerful it is and how special it is for us. And we are content with the peace that the Lord has given us. Romans 5.1 says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us that opportunity to have peace with him. We don't naturally have peace with God, but we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are united with God through Christ. So the seven words that describe reconciliation are number one, our salvation. If you look again at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Our salvation comes through Jesus Christ as God has provided the one who would be our savior. It says in he Ephesians chapter two, you who were afar off have been made near by the blood of Jesus Christ. How do we get far off from God? What happened to us? Well, it started a long time ago when Adam and Eve decided to go their own way. But we can't just blame them because each one of us does exactly the same thing. We go our own way. We reject God's plan for us. We say, I know what I want to do, and I want to do this. And God says, I have a plan for you, but we go our own way. And sin automatically separates us from God. And that's the reason why we need reconciliation. We need to be saved. We're lost. David Jeremiah, who's a wonderful pastor that many of you hear speaking on the radio, tells of a time early in his life when he felt a burden to witness to people and so he the first time he had a chance he asked someone who he just happened to be sitting next to and said are you saved and the man responded by saying 
No, I'm not. And it's people like you that I want to be saved from because you're confronting me with something I don't want to talk about. So David Jeremiah said, well, I guess I need to use a different approach. But the fact was true because people are lost and need to be saved. We're lost without Christ. And that's why the Lord says, now unto God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, there's an opportunity for salvation. Are we sinners? Paul said he was a sinner. Romans 7, he said, there are so many things that I don't want to do that I find myself doing. There are things that I want to do that I don't do. What is the matter with me? And he said, I have a sin nature. But thanks be to God who gives me the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes, we're lost until Christ comes in. And he can give us that strength and the peace that we need to be overcomers. Our salvation comes from God. First of all, we need to recognize that we're lost. Many people will not admit that they're lost. And maybe there was a time in our lives when we didn't want to admit that we're lost either. But we're lost without Christ. Even little children are lost until they find Christ. We believe that children are innocent until they able, are able to understand what it means to be saved. And then if they're brought up in the ways of the Lord, they'll accept Christ right away. So they won't be lost for eternity, but they still have a sin nature that needs to be corrected and taken away. Lost. Back in uh, 1968, Georgia and I and our family lived in northern Minnesota. After graduating from seminary in 1967, we moved to northern Minnesota, north of Bemidji, where it's really cold on these cold days. It was in January of that year, 1968, that I had invited my parents to come and visit us because we were having an ordination service. It was my privilege to be ordained that, that weekend. So my parents were making their way to northern Minnesota on a cold day. It got to be in the evening, and we expected them to come in about 10 o'clock in the evening. And we didn't hear from them. They weren't, weren't arriving. It got to be 10.30, 11 o'clock. And back in those days, believe it or not, we didn't have cell phones in those days. And so they couldn't call us and unless they stopped at a, at a station somewhere, but they had decided to take highway number two, which can head toward Bemidji or it can head toward Duluth. They happened to be heading toward Duluth, which was the opposite direction. And they were happily driving along, but they didn't realize until they had gone for about 50 miles that they were lost. They were going the wrong way. So they turned around. They finally arrived at our place at 12 o'clock at night. Then they told us a story. We were lost. And my dad, who doesn't like to, didn't like to listen to directions very well, said, I had to listen to mom. She said, we're going the wrong way. We had to turn around and go the right way. We are lost without Christ. We're going the wrong direction. We need to turn around. And it is only through Christ, through God, that we can be saved. And that word saved is an old-fashioned word, but it's a very important word, saved. Saved from sin, saved for Christ. Jesus said in Luke 10, 1910, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. In Romans chapter five, verses 10 and 11 say this, for if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We were lost. We needed to be brought back into fellowship with God, to be brought into fellowship with God. And that means we were reconciled through salvation and how blessed we are that we can be saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. The angel said, there is in Bethlehem a savior which is born. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Peace, 
reconciliation with God. It comes through personal faith in Jesus Christ. Reconciliation includes, number one, our salvation. Number two, our service. Back to verse 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. We are privileged to be able to serve our Lord. It's an honor to do that. It's a fabulous honor. And what is it that we are to do? We are to be ministers of reconciliation. Every Christian is to be a minister. We are called to reconcile others to Christ. It demands courage and humility. We are, as it says in verse 20 of our same text, ambassadors for Christ. We are just to do God's work, to try to minister to those who are lost. How do we do that? We do it just by living our faith out and when possible, sharing what God has done for us. And when we live our faith out, we can restore those who are broken. Believers who have been broken can also be restored. There can be reconciliation. As we serve the Lord, some of those cracks in our lives can be fixed because we have the message of reconciliation. Bring us into right relationship with God. It will only work if we are willing to yield to God and to surrender to him. We can't be stubborn. We can't be rebellious. We can't have pride. As it says in Romans 12, 18, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all people. Ephesians 4, that you walk worthy of the vocation or worthy you are called and endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We need that, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So reconciliation includes seven blessings. Number one, our salvation. Number two, our service. Number three, our submission. Verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. This speaks of submission. God was in Christ. When we submit to Christ, we submit to God. We submit to God, we submit to Christ. God was at work in the sacrifice of Christ. James 4, 7 says, Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So this is the requirement that God has for us. We are to submit to him and resist the devil. Is the devil active and alive today? Well, he's pretty busy. He's doing a lot to try to keep us from submitting to God. He wants to divert us, to distract us. It says in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seems right unto a human being, but the end thereof are the ways of death. When we go our own way, we're going the wrong way. When we submit to God, we're going the right way. And submission to God is a loving submission. It's not a submission of force. Now, there are some religions that believe in force. One of those religions is, as you know, Islam because they believe that we are to submit to Allah, submit in every way, do exactly what he says. But God is asking us to submit in a loving manner. He wants us to be obedient, but it's all because of his great love for us. Our gospel is so precious to us. And so our submission is involving sacrifice. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What does it mean to lay aside every weight? It means to take away, let God take away those things in our lives that hinder us from being all that God wants us to be. Some of those attitudes, some of those perhaps habits, the things that we do, the patterns in our lives. To let the Lord take those away, submit to him, let him clean out our hearts on a regular basis, a daily basis. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has foreordained that we should walk in those good works. Yes, uh, we are the clay and God is the potter. He is the one who molds our lives as we let him do that. It's a constant submission to the Lord. 
Reconciliation means seven things according to this text. Number one, our salvation. Number two, our service. Number three, our submission. And number four, our story. Verse 19, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. What is the word of reconciliation? The word of reconciliation is the message that God has put in our hearts, the story that we have. What has God done for us? Every one of us has a story. Thank you, Lord, that we have a story. What is our story? They're all different. They're all unique. They're all special. And it's our story that God wants us to share. He has given to us the word of reconciliation. And there are certain people that come into our lives that we can connect with and that God will help us to share what we have in our hearts that will be meaningful to them because we're telling our story. This is what Jesus has done for me. And as we share our story, we will be blessed. And God will use us and others will be touched. And maybe down the road somewhere, someone will actually be saved because of our story. And our story is based on the word of God and the work of Christ. We read in 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a special people. You are not the people of God, but now you are the people of God. Peter says, now you are special. God is, can use you, you have a story because you belong to the Lord. Don't you love this verse, Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I, I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm dead to myself, but I'm alive to Christ. I'm very much alive because Christ is in me. He's always working in my heart. He's working in my mind. He's working my thoughts. He's not letting me rest without thinking about him. He's not letting me drift out away from him because I know about him. And I have the word of reconciliation. I have a story that he's given me. I'm crucified with Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And as we said earlier, Romans 5.1, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What a story God has given to each one of us. Number five, reconciliation includes our strength. We go on to read here, now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. How can we do that? As we look at Bible characters through the Old Testament, God called so many of them to be his spokespeople. And almost everyone, not everyone, but almost everyone said, I can't do it, Lord. I, I don't want to do it. You're calling me to do something that I can't do. Even Moses, that great and wonderful leader of the people of Israel, he gave five excuses for why he couldn't lead the people of Israel. He said, I can't speak very well. I don't have any credibility. How will I know who is sending me when I stand before Pharaoh? And finally, his last excuse was, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And that's sometimes the way we are. I, we don't want to do it. But God is saying, I'm calling you to tell your story when the appropriate time comes. And God will give us some opportunities if we pray and ask him for those opportunities. Some of the opportunities that I've had are a blessing to me, and I, they're not in usual places. There are times when I one of my favorite things is to talk to attendants at the gas station. Go in and talk to them about things that they're interested in, and eventually they ask me, what, what are your special goals in life? Because I'll usually ask them, what are your goals in life? And they ask me, what are your goals in life? Well, my goal is to try to honor and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm, okay, what does that mean? So if we approach it in the way that they can ask us questions. We can answer the questions. That's a helpful way to share our faith. But God has given us the ministry of reconciliation, and he has given us strength to be able to share that ministry. And that's number five, our strength. Our strength comes from the Lord. We read in John 14, 27, 
peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Isaiah chapter 40 has some wonderful words for us. Verses 29 through 31. But he gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But to those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God has promised us strength, the strength of the Lord. We don't need to fear. Even when we are weak, God's strength can come through. Talking to Sheila about a week and a half ago, Sheila, as you know, Sheila Massey is one of the bright lights in our church. She's one of our greeters who serves the Lord and always has a wonderful countenance. And she had a stroke about three weeks ago. She was sharing that in her rehabilitation in the hospital, at Regents Hospital, and she has now just come home from the hospital, but in her rehabilitation, she said, as I'm trying to learn how to use my left side again, which is pretty difficult, I'm able to talk to the therapist because they're working with me all day, from nine in the morning to four in the afternoon. And I'm willing to share with the faith that I have. Even in my weakness, I can share God's strength. What a blessing that was to hear that. So our strength comes from the Lord. Number six, we're talking about reconciliation, what it includes. It includes our substitute. Verse 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Who is the him? It's Jesus, isn't it? God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us. He's our substitute. He's the perfect lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God, John said, who takes away the sin of the world. This was God's precious Lamb. And we know that according to tradition in the Old Testament, when lambs were given for sacrifice, they were, had to be perfect little lambs, one year old, without spot or blemish. And these little lambs were actually very precious to the families because they kept them in their home and they were like little pets. And when they had to give up a lamb, it hurt them. It was a sacrifice to give up that lamb and sacrifice it. And God had to give up his own son, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as Bobby read this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15, thanks be to God for his undescribable gift. Number seven is our security. The last part of verse 21, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That means for sure. God will, because of Christ, give us righteousness. Do we deserve it? No. Do we earn it? No. It's a gift from God. It's a great Christmas gift that God gives to all who believe. Our security is in Christ. There are so many verses in the Bible that talk about our security. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Christ. 1 John 5.13, which tells us that we know that he has given us eternal life and we shall continue to believe in him because he has given us that eternal life. 2 Timothy 1.12, we know whom we have believed. We're persuaded that he is able to keep that which we committed unto him until that day, the final day, when we will be with Christ. So what we've talked about this morning, we've talked about peace with God, the word reconciliation. There are seven words that describe our reconciliation. And the words are, number one, our salvation. Number two, our service. Number three, our submission. Number four, our story. Number five, our strength. Number six, our substitute. And number seven, our security. And for me, they all come from this event that's described here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 18 through 21. There are so many blessings that we share at Christmas, and today I wanted us to think a little bit beyond just the manger to the depth of the Christmas story and how it impacts us and how it will impact us for all of our lives.
After I share just a couple more thoughts, I'd like to ask Mike if he would come and sing a special song for us. I always enjoy hearing Mike sing, and he said, you can call on me any Sunday, and I just feel led to call on you today, Mike. But this is a, a doctor named Dr. Curtis Bradford from Charleston, South Carolina. He tells that when he was seven years old, what Christmas, there was a Christmas event that he remembers. It was Christmas Eve, and on, in their home, they would get up early on Christmas Day to open presents that were around the tree. But it was Christmas Eve, it was about two o'clock in the morning, he couldn't sleep because he was thinking about what presents am I gonna get? So he got up two o'clock in the morning, went down to the tree and started to look through the presents, and he found something that he really loved and he was gonna get it, it was a drum set. Could he play the drums at two o'clock in the morning with his parents sleeping? Well, he didn't dare do that. He found a couple of other things and one was a puppet and he was play with the puppet, and then there was a little cowboy outfit that he liked, was hoping he would get. And then, just as he was looking through these gifts, he looked up and there was his dad, looking down at him sternly. What are you doing here at two o'clock in the morning? But then, he saw his dad smile, and he realized that it was okay. So his dad sat down on the chair beside him, and. He started looking through his gifts and his dad was showing him how he could use that little six shooter that was part of the cowboy outfit. And, and as he was with his dad, he fell asleep because he hadn't slept two o'clock in the morning. So his dad picked him up and carried him up to his bedroom. Next morning they got up and celebrated Christmas. 30 years later, it was Christmas Eve again. He was at his parents' home this time, his dad was up in his bedroom because his dad had had severe cancer and was near death. So he went up to ask his dad if he could come down and spend Christmas Eve with them. His dad said, yes, but could you shave me first because he hadn't shaved for a while. So his son was shaving him and he said, no, my whiskers are growing in all different directions. Can you get it? And so he was meticulously working with his dad and then he had to carry his dad downstairs because his dad had, had lost weight and he was under 100 pounds and he couldn't walk. He took him downstairs and there they had Christmas Eve and in about 15 minutes, his dad had so much pain that he couldn't stay any longer. So once again, his son carried him upstairs, and put him in bed. And then his dad said, could you turn on the, the radio because there's a station that I'd like to listen to and they're gonna have the Christmas story tonight. So he turned on the radio and said, it happened in the days of Caesar Augustus. There was a taxation, all the world went to be taxed. Everyone into his own city. Joseph also, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea onto the city of David to be taxed with Mary as a spouse, wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And as the shepherds were in the fields, lo, there was an angel that appeared to them, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And suddenly the the entire sky was filled with angels praising God and saying glory to God. And the shepherds said, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. And as they read the Christmas story, the father began to weep and the son began to weep. And they hugged each other and the dad said, son, these are tears of joy because this isn't the end of our time together. There's so much more, we have eternity. We have forever to be together because of the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace. And so today we say, thank you, Jesus, that you are the Prince of Peace. You have been the one who has reconciled us from our sins. We were lost, but you found us. And now we're with you forever. We'll never be lost again. You never lose one of your sheep. We have the promises of God. That's the real Christmas story, isn't it? It's not just presents and gifts. 
That's okay, but the real story is God came to redeem us and give us a home forever with him. Mike, would you come and sing a song for us, please? flowered amid the snow upon a winter's night was born the child the Christmas rose the king of love and light the angels sing the shepherd's song the grateful earth rejoiced and at his blessed birth the stars in exultation voice oh come let us Thank you for that wonderful message, Mike. I'd like to invite our worship team to come and lead us in our song of invitation. Every Sunday we have an invitation, and that is always to trust in the Lord as personal Savior. If there's anyone who's never made that decision, we'd love to have you come. We could pray with you. If there's someone who'd like to come and say, I'd like to become a member of Bethel Baptist Church, we'd love to have you come and share your story of faith and be welcomed into our church. The other part of the invitation is that if someone would like to just come and pray in the front, you're welcome to do that. And for those watching online today, if you'd like to pray and ask the Lord to come into your life, just ask him to save you and to take away your sin, to be your Lord, and he will. Let us stand together as we sing our song of invitation.
our service, I'd like to ask Teja, would you come and lead us in our closing prayer this morning, please? We appreciate everyone who comes from different parts of the Twin Cities. Teja, you come from Minnetonka, right? Yep. Thank you so much for being a part of our church family. Dear gracious Lord, thank you for adding this wonderful day in our life, Lord, uh, to be here in the presence of your uh, church, a lot. Thank you for everyone who came to church. Thank you for everyone and protecting us in this weather a lot. Thank you for the wonderful message by Pastor Don, by learning all the seven words a lot. Help us to walk in this uh, whole week a lot. Uh, help us to show your love towards our friends and neighbors and workplace a lot. Help us everything in our uh, spiritual life as a lot. I ask all these things in highly exalted and mostly in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Teja. We'd like to uh, ask everyone to take one of the cakes that Georgia has baked. I know they're good because I sampled them. So I think you'll like it. They're on the table out in the foyer.